In this video, I'll discuss several techniques that we use to time the market. We'll discuss formula plans, I'll talk about stop loss orders, I'll talk about what to do with excess liquidity, and finally I'll discuss tax implications. All right, so why should you want to time the market? Well, that's pretty straightforward. Essentially, if you can time the market, that could be a profitable trading strategy. I mean, our goal as investors is to buy low and sell high, or if we can identify overvalued securities, we could short high and then buy low and also make a profit. Now, there's several methods we can use to time the market. Uh, first, I'll discuss formula plans. There's four types I'll discuss. Then I'll discuss how we use limit orders and stop loss orders. Then I'll discuss how we actually invest in liquid securities, and then finally I'll discuss how you actually time your investment sales. All right, so formula plans are pretty straightforward. Basically, these are methods that portfolio managers or individual investors use to take advantage of cyclical price movements. And these are generally used by conservative investors. So in most cases, you're investing a set amount following some trading rule. What the trading rules are will depend on the plan. Now, the first formula plan we have is dollar cost averaging. And this is probably our, our simplest rule. And in this case, essentially what we're doing is we're investing the same amount in every single period. So you're investing the same amount in each security at regular time intervals. It's essentially a passive buy and hold strategy. And the key here is that you're investing the same dollar amount. Now, over the course of time, the price of the shares that you're purchasing will increase or decrease. So this means that you're purchasing a different number of shares every time that you invest in that security. So let's take a look at why this is. So here in this example, we have a security and the, the NAV of the security fluctuates through time. And if you're investing $500, let's say in this security, then in January, if the NAV is $26, you're investing in or purchasing about just over 19 shares. If the share price rises or the NAV rises from $26 to let's say $27.46 in February, now you can only afford $18.21. Now, the reason dollar cost averaging is said to work is because you're buying fewer shares when the share price is high and you're buying more shares when the share price is low. So for example, in the case of August, you're buying more shares, so 20.7 shares. Now the end result is that you've invested in a certain number of shares, and while you might have only invested $6,000 total, the end, at the end of the period, you've regularly been investing, and so those total shares will be worth about $6,800. Now here we have the basic summary. It's pretty much exactly what I just said. So you're investing 6000 total, $5,000 per month for 12 months. You invested in 227 uh, shares of this stock, and the average cost was $26.32. And from this, you can calculate your portfolio value. Now, the next type of plan that we have is the constant dollar plan. And this is a plan where we break up the portfolio, or rather our portfolio, into two parts, a speculative part and a conservative part. And the speculative part is, I mean, it's just like any other speculative investment that we've been talking about in this class. It's highly risky. It's high risk, high potential reward. In other words, a high return, uh, although that's obviously not guaranteed. Now, the conservative portion is going to be obviously low risk, low return, or low expected return. And the key here is that when the speculative portion of your portfolio pays off, what you're going to do is you're going to skim off those that excess capital, that cap, those capital gains, and invest that, or you could call it, you could say bank it, in the conservative portion of your portfolio. Now, if the reverse is true, let's say the value of your speculative portion of your portfolio it decreases, let's say you have some significant capital losses, what you can do is you can use the conservative portion of your portfolio, whatever 
that's invested in to cover those losses. So let's take a look at this. So in this constant dollar plan example, we have, again, this this portfolio starting at a, a value of $20,000 broken up equally weighted in speculative portion and conservative portion. So 50-50 in terms of weights. And then over time, notice here that the value of the speculative portion, it actually rises to $12,000 and the value of the conservative portion stays at $10,000. Well, here, what you're doing is once you see the value of your speculative portion grow, you're going to liquidate this portion, uh, the, the capital gains in this portion of your portfolio, the $2,000 that you've earned on this speculative portion of your portfolio, and you're going to use it to invest in whatever is in your conservative portion. You're essentially banking that in the conservative portion of your portfolio. So here you're selling 166.67 shares of whatever is in your speculative portfolio. And now this you, you've essentially banked some capital gains. Now, the reverse can also be true. Let's say that, oh, in the case that uh, the value of your speculative portion falls from $10,000 to $7,916. Well, now you can use the capital gains that you banked in the conservative portion of your portfolio and invest those in the speculative portion. So you're essentially covering the, the capital losses. And here you're, you're just purchasing 219 do, uh, shares worth of the speculative uh, securities. And notice here that when you're doing that, you're buying potentially undervalued speculative shares. So this is one of the reasons why constant dollar plans are relatively popular. I mean, it's, essentially, it's it's almost like mental accounting, or you're, you're essentially banking gains. And the the thought process here is that, you know, hopefully the, the value, the value of your total portfolio will increase over time. Now, there are two other formula plans that I should cover here, and those are the constant ratio plan and the variable ratio plan. And these are fairly similar. There's really only one quirk that makes these things different, but uh, with both of these, you're essentially adjusting the ratio between the speculative and the conservative portion of your plans. With constant ratio, you're setting it back to the initial value, whereas with the variable ratio plan, you just want it within some range. So if it gets too high, you bring it back down within uh, a decent range. If it gets too low, you're increasing the, the value of your speculative portion uh, back within a reasonable range. So let's take a look at the conservative ratio plan first. So with the conservative ratio plan, again, we have a speculative portion and a conservative portion. And let's say that same thing that we had last time, the value of your speculative portion of your portfolio increases from $10,000 to $12,000. Well, what this means is that the ratio of speculative to conservative portion has increased from a starting value of 1 to 1.2. Now, what we're going to do with a constant ratio plan is when we see this, we adjust our weights in the speculative portion and the conservative portion so that we get back down to one. So this is why we call it the constant ratio plan. So here, we're going to sell 83.33 shares of the speculative portion of our portfolio, and that's going to get us back down to 11,000 in both of our portions. Now, in... Down here, we can have the reverse. So let's say the, the value of our speculative portion of our portfolio fell from 11000 that we ended up with at the end of this period to 8250 Well, now our ratio has fallen from 1 to 0.75. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this $11,000 and we're going to liquidate a portion of that to, uh, well, to essentially purchase 152 0.78 shares of our speculative securities, and that'll get us back down to essentially an equally weighted portfolio. And this is going to continue going forward in time. So this is what we do with the, cons the constant ratio plan. The variable ratio plan is fairly similar, except we just really have a, a range of ratios between our speculative portion and our conservative portion. So here, 
we start out with a uh, ratio of uh, speculative to conservative or, uh, well, just equal weighting. So our, our ratio here is going to be 0.5. Uh, let's say that the uh, value of our speculative portion increases from 10,000 to 15,000. And now that means that the that represents, well, 15,000 divided by, well, 15 plus 10,000 or 25,000. So that represents 0.6% uh, of our portfolio. So it's, it's increased. Now, uh, what this means is that we might be at the, the top range or the top of the range that we really want in our speculative portion of our portfolio. Maybe this is a little too highly weighted in risky assets. So what we're going to do is we're going to use... Uh, we're going to sell off shares of this speculative asset, and in this case, we're selling 250 shares, and we're going to invest those that that capital or cash that we sold uh, those shares for in the conservative portion. That's going to get us back down to a, a ratio that is a little lower than what we started at, but we, we might be expecting that this could rise past our starting value and eventually uh, appreciate back to this point six where we'll have to sell off more shares of our speculative portion. It's really up to you. Uh, now, the reverse, again, can also be true. So let's say, in this case, we we see the value of our speculative portion fall from 11,250 to 7,500. And what that means is the ratio of speculative to conservative has fallen, we'll say, down to the, the lower bound of what we really want. We want to keep this, this ratio within... Uh, bounds. So in this case, uh, our, our bounds are going to be 0.35 and 0.6. So what we're going to do is we're going to liquidate the portion of our conservative, or the conservative portion of our portfolio, and invest that in our speculative portion. And that'll get us back up to a, a healthy ratio. So this can go on forever and ever, really. All right, so that's how we use formula plans. Now let's talk about something that you're, you're a little more familiar with, limit orders and stop loss orders. So limit orders, we can use these to essentially sell or buy securities whenever we need. And the reason I, I mention these when we talk about timing is that these orders can remain open for a period of time, maybe till the end of uh, the day, or depending on our broker, they could remain for several days. And so the reason this is important is that if we want to buy or sell securities, if the share price falls, let's say, to a certain price, let's say we use limit buy orders, and the share prices or the price of the shares that we're wanting to buy falls to those that, that limit buy price, well, now we're going to buy it. Uh, the reverse can be true if we use limit sell orders. Let's say the, the price of a particular security that we uh, we own has appreciated and we've put in a limit sell order that says don't sell if the share price is below 75 and the share price rises to 75, well now we can sell. Uh, so that can help us time the market. So we're selling out when the price is high or we're buying when the price is low enough. Now with stop loss orders, the reverse is true. And I know I've mentioned stop loss orders as well in this early, very early in this class, but you know we, we care about them when we want to time the market because if we put in a stop loss order, in the case that there's some really bad news coming out about a stock that we own, we can sell off that stock. So we can put in a stop loss order to sell our shares if the share price falls below, let's say, $40. Well, in the case of, let's say, a horrible piece of news that affects our stock, we're automatically going to sell those shares, our shares of that stock, or however many shares we're specifying. Now, the risk of stop loss orders or stop by orders is that we can suffer what's called whipsawing. And whipsawing occurs when, let's say, there's a very rapid and volatile change. So the share price falls very far and then it rises quickly. So this could be due to one investor trying to sell off all their shares at once and then other investors realizing that, oh, perhaps this, this stock is now undervalued. So they, they immediately buy up those shares that are now very, very heavily undervalued. So whipsawing can, can actually, if we're, if we're using lo stop loss orders, that can actually be a very bad thing for us. Now, one question you might have is, you know, if you're timing the market and you're holding 
a portion of your portfolio in some assets, you might want to remain fairly liquid just in case that you need to invest heavily in some undervalued or overvalued security. So the question is, how do you do this? And the answer is pretty straightforward. You just invest in liquid assets. So if you want to, you could invest in, let's say, money market securities, so T-bills or commercial paper, or if you can find a bank or a credit union that offers a a high interest rate uh, checking or savings account, you can deposit your money there while you're waiting for some other, let's say, equities to fall to valuations that you think are appropriate. Uh, so you can do all kinds of things to remain liquid, but generally you're, you're investing your money in very, very low risk and relatively low return securities, but those securities should often offer a higher return than inflation. Well, ideally. Now, one thing you need to consider, or two final things that you need to consider when you are trying to time the market, are tax consequences and achieving your goals. So let's start with ta tax consequences. Now, there are some issues with taxes that determine when you want to liquidate your assets in your portfolio. So earlier in this class, I talked I talked about the difference between long-term and short-term capital gains, and the issue here is that if you are liquidating your assets or uh, security in your portfolio it, less than a year after you bought it, any capital gains you earn are going to be taxed at your individual tax rate. So it'd be essentially seen as ordinary income from the perspective of the IRS or the state where you are living. Uh, but uh, if you are holding those securities for at least a year, there are a couple of benefits. First off, you get to pay the capital gains tax rate, which is uh, often lower. And then let's say you, you sell your shares for a capital loss. Well, right now on the books, there is the uh, you can actually write off up to $3,000 in capital losses in at least in, in one year. So let's say that in 2019, I liquidated shares of one security and I saw $3,000 worth of capital losses. Well, next year in 2020, if I see, let's say, uh, let's say I have a certain amount of taxes or capital gains taxes, I can offset that with the, the losses that I suffered in 2019. Now, uh, in terms of capital gains taxes, uh, tax rate. What you're seeing right now, these are the 2020 long-term capital gains tax rates. So we have four filing statuses. So most of the people listening to this video are going to be single. Some people will be married filing jointly. Some will be married filing separately. It just means that both you and your spouse are paying uh, taxes separately. Or you could file as head of household. Uh, now, Depending on how you file and how much your income is, that's going to determine your long-term capital gains tax rate. So let's say you made $150,000 and you filed separately from your spouse. Well, in that case, the first $40,000 that you earn, you don't pay taxes on because 0% tax rate. Anything between $40,000 and about a quarter of a million, you pay a 15% tax rate on or capital gains tax rate. So in this case, if you earned $150,000, your capital gains tax would be $150,000 minus $40,000 uh, times 0.15. And then our marginal tax rate increases uh, when, once we earn over $248,000 in, in capital gains. All right, so let's sum up. First, I talked about several methods that we can use the, to time the market. So several formula plans. Some people use one, some use another. Others will use formula plans that I didn't describe in this video. You can also use stop loss or limit orders to time the market. And then you can also, well, when you, when you do try to time the market, you're going to want to consider the tax implications of your, your, of your sales. 
So you want to make sure that you're, you're not uh, selling all of your assets when you have significant capital gains and incurring the, the maximum capital gains tax rate. Uh, that's, that's not efficient. So with that, I'm going to wrap up. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me via email or phone or stop by my office hours. And I will see you on the next video.